Thank you, Mr. Goel, uh, President Mr. Prasanna Kumar, my good friend, Mr. K.D. Malhotra. Uh, thank you for joining us to answer all the questions. Uh, my young friends, good morning. It is absolutely a pleasure uh, to be able to interact with you. Mine will be an interactive session. Uh, it will be an 85-minute session from now. We'll wind up at 12.30 sharp. So uh, what I would request you, if possible, and all of you are quite handsome and beautiful and good-looking, so if you can switch on your videos, it will help to in making this session more interactive. I plan to pr provide you a perspective or a framework to analyze India's external relationships, India's challenges, India's opportunities. Uh, I will not concentrate on the what, but I will concentrate on the why. The what's, the facts, figures, etc. you can all, all get. So let me kick start the discussions and it, I'll go back and forth. I'll be throwing questions at you and would welcome questions. So that is how we'll go about it. Well, in the third decade of the 21st century, where are we? Uh, India is arguably going through the most critical, difficult phase in our history. Uh, China is at our border. The ties between Russia and West have been ruptured. From what one can make out, they're going in for a head-on collision. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I really hope that uh, cooler heads prevail and they can take a step back because the way they are engaging in brickmanship, one uh, trying to outdo the other, uh, I think uh, the world is heading towards uh, a territory or a situation where, uh, which we are not used to. India uh, has had to take very tough decisions of late. We lost our political innocence in 1948. As you remember, uh, Prime Minister Nehru had a romantic view of international relations. He believed in equity. He believed in fairness of the systems. And he took the Kashmir issue to the UN. And we are still paying the price for uh, uh, that move of trust or believing that the international uh, uh, arrangement, international relations are based on equity or on, or, or on logic. And I would say that another watershed moment has been the Chinese aggression uh, against India in Eastern Ladakh region at Galwan and the Galwan episode in particular which has forced us to drop our reticence. We had hitherto been very conscious of trying to engage with China and trying to be more and more and more much uh, very sensitive to Chinese concerns. But I think uh, we have been forced to draw, drop our reticence and decided to extend our relations and larger relations with the West and uh, the Quad. At one level, we will hear the, the phraseology India is re-emerging because we were uh, one of the, uh, we were the second biggest economy in even in the early uh, 18th century. And uh, by the time we got our independence, our GDP was down to 1% of the global GDP, but we are again re-emerging as a prominent actor on the international stage. Uh, subject to certain qualifications, we should become the third largest economy by mid 2030s. But young India, aspirational India, the biggest democracy that we are is located in a very difficult geography, a challenging ge geography. We have shown that despite, despite the challenging geography, we can do things. We have become the responder, uh, first responder for rescue and relief operations in the region and beyond. Uh, we are ready to assume greater responsibilities in the Committee of Nations. Uh, we have a legitimate claim on the permanent membership of the UN Security Council, but claim does not mean very much in this uh, world of power politics. It is not your qualifications, but uh, it is tough. And, uh, I don't think that in my lifetime, we'll be able to get a permanent membership of the UN Security Council. I am being a little provocative, but 
China will never allow that and countries which are permanent members do not want to see further expansion because tell me what justification in today's world does England have to be a permanent member but they will never give up uh, uh, their their position uh, on the other hand for us we have a neighborhood that is suspicious hostile and even inimical having said that let me clarify at the outset that nowhere in the world do neighbors have trouble free relations i was posted as high commissioner to canada uh, canada and the us have the closest of relations possible but still there are strains uh, look at the irony and i would like you to ponder over it our freedom struggle was mostly non violent yet india's birth was accompanied by bloodshed and over the last 75 years we have handled numerous external conflicts proxy wars internal civil strifes but we have proven the cassandra is wrong we have proven the doomsday scenario is wrong and we are marching ahead but as i said never in our since our independence have we faced such a threat as we are facing from china uh, which is not only powerful but a country to which very few rules apply and i'll come back to that but i would like you to take note of uh, some trends in india's outlook one is that notwithstanding the lip service that is paid in some quarters the era of non aligned movement is dead over uh, we say that we have entered into a phase of multi alignment which is a play of words because we have always been multi aligned there is Uh, nothing new about it but uh, we presented as uh, multi alignment we are officially uh, in the business of partnerships not getting into alliances to keep our strategic autonomy intact but what is strategic autonomy strategic autonomy is the ability to take independent decisions it is nothing esoteric it is nothing unique to india we call it strategic autonomy uh, some other countries can call it what they do but every country wants to have strategic autonomy question is can they exercise the strategic autonomy or not uh, but whenever there has been a necessity we have done what we have ne- wanted to do or needed to do despite not uh, despite saying that we don't want to get into alliances in 1971 the treaty of peace friendship and cooperation with ussr was nothing short of an alliance but we didn't call it that and there is no need to in diplomacy uh, it nothing is black and white there are shades of gray and uh, you present things in a way that suits your national interest uh now we are talking of the possibility of issue based alliances whatever it means and uh, we were on the way to become uh, uh we develop a kind of a quasi alliance with the us now what happens uh, uh, in the aftermath of the russia west confrontation i do not know but the inhibiting factor has been r- american unilateralism her propensity to bring in extraneous issues to satisfy domestic agenda and the as any what we have we have is not to complain because complaining does not help understand what it's about and it is to see the world through its own has at times been impatient with india's geographical compulsions strategic security needs economic interests let me give you an example when we are told oh now that india has taken a stance uh, india has been uh, been soft on russia this that oh india is talking to the military junta oh india is doing that i mean this is what every country does some do it blatantly some don't let me give you an example which you you will like to remember and uh, use to point out the double standards that are exercised by powerful nations and they do that because they can 
in the world of diplomacy you do things if you can if you don't you are uh, hauled to the international court of justice i mean during the uh, uh, the war on terror in afghanistan the us wanted india's india to send its army we pondered before that during the first gulf war also the us wanted to uh, us to send our army now why is the us was the us in afghanistan to take care of al qaeda to take care of taliban but mr washington uh, i'm dramatizing it a little but you know when we took it up took up the matter of uh, another set of terrorists which are on the pakistani soil pointing out that pakistan is not source of the problem uh, source of the solution but not the uh, a solution but the source of the problem you said no 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 we cannot do that so you want our support but you are not willing to appreciate our security concerns hafiz saeed has a 10 billion million dollar bounty on his head he roams about freely but an al qaeda operative or a islamic state operative is taken out uh, through a drone why because us interests do not converge with india's interest and they find pakistan of strategic importance so therefore india is told to exercise patience whereas us will go ahead and even take out the uh, head of the uh, iranian force so this this is the reality of uh, power politics again the solution is to become stronger not to complain because you have to play the rules of the game as they are outlined by the big players till you become a big player yourself so reinforcing relationships and safeguarding our core interests is the biggest challenge and opportunity for india former foreign secretary shiv shankar menon says that the world is between orders uh, there are lots of moving pieces there are lots of cross currents the unipolar world came to an end in 2008 when the economic crisis happened today the world world is multipolar economic and perhaps unipolar militarily china is snapping at its heels so you can see a new a great game unfolding the established international norms put more in breach this diplomacy uh, has to be reached what is new is cultural sensitivity to what is going on uh before i come to you with with your asking for your questions let me just make a couple of other comments that power prestige all comes from hard power standing comes from hard power and hard power is of course your your defensive and offensive capabilities but at the base of everything is economy i have always been pointing out that you cannot have hard power without economic power and the rest flows from economic power if you do not have resources you cannot have defenses you cannot have the capability of to deter adversaries so it is the economy first is the economy second and economic third and soft power per se cannot be effective if you have hard hard power then soft power becomes attractive otherwise there is a tendency of romanticizing soft power over emphasizing soft power but without hard power soft power is not effective role of a diplomat it was said that 
Diplomat is a gentleman who goes out to life or the country, no longer. No longer, please do note that whether you are an a diplomat or you are an administrative officer, credibility is the most important thing. And in today's digital era, you are fact-checked in, in, in minutes or even less than that. Once the credibility is gone, it becomes very difficult. So this is a time of exactitude, of marshalling your facts to come up with a credible narrative, even if it is at variance with the prevailing narrative, so long as you don't get caught on facts. So let me pause here and come back to you. Uh, re we'll request you to switch on your videos if anybody has a question or comment before I move further. Yes, Pankaj. Yeah, hello, morning, sir. Uh, sir, I had morning. a question uh, related to the neighborhood. Sir, uh, often India is caught in a dichotomy that if it tries to help someone, help the country in a way, then it is painted as a big brother. I, we can cite the example of India out campaign in Maldives or similar narratives in Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. So, sir, how should India go forward in this arena? Because we need to help them, we want to help them, we need some kind of uh, support there, but at the same time, we are caught in this uh, political battlefield there. Well, my friend, that is what life is. Uh, you know, and look at a family, you uh, want help from your elder brother, but you resent that he can give you help. I mean, that's that's how it is. Uh, you know, the, the it is a very thankless world in one way, because the problem is that the person who, or country or person who, who helps expects appreciation and gratitude, which never happens. So if you, and when you help, there is also a feeling that, ah, uh, what will, you know, use the media takes credit, somebody takes credit and it brews resentment. Remember what happened when uh, there was this uh, crisis a couple of years ago in Nepal, there was an earthquake and uh, we were the first, we were there first to provide assistance and wholesome assistance. But what is the feedback we got? We, <laughs> We said, oh, the, it was substandard. Oh, we are doing this. We are doing... That is how it is. So the way forward is to take it on the chin, do what you can, not expect uh, appreciation, uh, not expect gratitude. In fact, in diplomacy, underplaying your uh, contribution at times is better. But what happens is that for political reasons and for various reasons, at times you kind of highlight it, which is resented. Sonal. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Morning. So my, so my question is, uh, we say that we've trans, we made a transition from a big brother attitude to an elder brother attitude. So how is it just about building narratives or is there an actual on ground change? What is the difference, my dear, between a big brother and an elder brother? Sir, more friendly relation. <laughs> No, whether it is big brother or elder brother or brother, even brother is resented. You know, when you tell a Nepali that we uh, we are the same, I mean, you have you have managed to uh, damage his identity. His identity is not India. He does not want to be same because uh, Ziaul Haq used to once used to say that if you take Islam out of Pakistan, then a Pakistan is an Indian. So you do not want to be an Indian. You see, the challenge is that we are the largest country in our neighborhood. I, I would have come to that, but I'm happy that you have asked this question. Uh, we have huge resources. We have capabilities. We have a vision. And like it or not, that is resented. It is we are a source of envy. We are a source of resentment. And also, let us face it, we don't help matters. Uh, we do throw our way, weight around. Uh, I mean, I don't want to point out, but you do introspect how we behave with uh, people from some of our neighboring countries, how we actually behave with people from, uh, let's say, other continents, uh, continents which are uh, not uh, very well developed. So we also give a lot of cause for uh, concern. And uh, there, this is very natural for these resentment to come in. 
And what has happened now is that there is a new development is the lengthening shadow of China in the region. Uh, one of the uh, senior academics from a neighboring country told me, he said, Mr. Prakash, for 50 years, we did not have a leverage. Today, we have a leverage and we are going to exercise it. So we, for us, our challenge in the neighborhood is going to become more. But uh, to, to be very frank, we say that we have transitioned from a big brother to an elder brother. But uh, the, this is, uh, well, this, this is good enough to say, but we need to do even better. And uh, we have, what we have done is that we have stopped expecting reciprocity to a large extent. Uh, so what we need to do is to build on our cultural linkages without being overbearing, without telling it, it let uh, the neighbors have their own cultural identity, but do what you can, do not tom tom it, do not have expectations. It's easier said than done, but that's what it is. Please understand that if we are assisting our neighbors, we are not doing them a favor, we are doing a favor to ourselves. For the simple reason that if we have to play uh, the due role in the international arena, we need to get our uh, neighborhood right. Uh, it's like if the, the head of the family, it's a very bad example, but suppose in a, in a village, a certain, uh, not even a head of the village, but some a prominent person wants to leave his family behind and go out uh, in the world. And uh, the family is disturbed back home or there's trouble back home, he cannot work. You have to have peace and tranquility along your boundaries, along in your neighborhood. But that is, as I said, easier said than done. Uh, and uh, China is not making it easy. The Belt and Road Initiative of China, we can say whatever we can, uh, we are saying, and we are saying that right, because it is uh, not uh, altruism, it is pure politics, but it is making an impact. There are developmental needs of our neighbors and they're going to use it. So if you put yourself in the shoes of a neighboring country, you will get the answers. They will do what it does to extract uh, what they can from you and from China and try to keep everybody at arm's length. Uh, last question, uh, Avdesh. Sanchit, I'll have to come back to you later because uh, I need to move on, but I'll come back to you later. Yes, Avdesh. Good morning, sir. Sir, my question roots again from the current position of China in our neighborhood. As we see that, uh, like as you also enlightened us, that economic power is the root basis of every other diplomatic aspect of our uh, foreign policy. And now we are seeing growing uh, like heft of China in our neighborhood. And despite being uh, having noble ideas like new pencil, our neighborhood is like aligning more towards Chinese poli policies and Chinese diplomacy. What should be our like way out so that we can balance and we can realign our image uh, for uh, you know uh, better diplomatic relations with our neighborhood? No. You use two radioactive words. One is to balance, and uh, the other one I forgot. Uh, we cannot get into a checkbook diplomatic competition with China. They have a very deep pocket. Their GDP is five times India's GDP, and they will uh, throw their money around. Uh, we have to be patient, 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 patient. And uh, we have to continue doing what we are doing. It is not going to be easy. It is going to be a tough task. but. You see, China has, the, at the moment, there is a lot of attraction for China because, as I said, countries have developmental needs and they have the checkbook. But China is no democracy. They are rather impatient with democracies. And China has this, uh, they may camouflage it now, they may put a veneer, but basically they are a prescriptive nation. They don't understand the South Asian politics. They don't understand the South Asian sensitivities. Um, re remember the Chinese ambassador in Nepal went about trying to uh, forge 
a new communist government and told prime minister oli to uh, to resign uh, it backfired in bangladesh the chinese ambassador uh, told uh, bangladeshis not to join uh, quad they were not joining quad so and then they are not giving you grants they are giving you loans countries are getting indebted so yes uh, it is possible that china will find that resentment will build because of their high handedness because that's what they are for us uh the, we have a geographical advantage we have proximity we have cultural linkages historical linkages and we should build on that look at how we our relations with bangladesh have been changed and i believe that if we get the bangladesh equation right we get it all right but it will require much more of effort on uh at the highest level not full and this uh to have i have already touched upon that but let me see say that the this changing the neighborhood are future but as evokes uh, we want to play a global role befitting our stature for which we need a peaceful neighborhood the way to do is to develop stakes to help develop stakes of our neighbors in india's growth and that again bottom line is economy if you interlink economies of india's neighborhood economies with indian economies then india's growth becomes their growth dr manmohan singh used to say that we should be like a tide which lifts all the boats and there again we need to have a different mindset let me give you an example we if we have free trade agreements with the neighbors the tendency is to put restrictions to have a negative list to ask seek reciprocity why look at your economy look at the neighbor's economy even if the neighbor so long as these are not chinese goods that are coming in there are uh, there are pro- products and produce of a neighboring countries throw your doors open let our neighbors know that you know you are the reason for their economic success invest in our neighbors we are doing that but we need to do more and uh, our record so far has been mixed with bhutan and afghanistan we have traditionally had good relations with nepal sri lanka maldives at times the relationship has been strained bangladesh is a success story which i mentioned it's a society which is divided between islamists which are pro pakistan and moderates but sheikh hasina has been an exceptionally a uh, uh, visionary leader who has tried to contain the islamists and build uh, bangladesh and the fact that bangladesh's per capita income has crossed ours is something that uh, we need to take note of and complement bangladesh from a near basket case to be an economic success story let me spend a few minutes on pakistan sir sir just a second main raju bol raha hu sir ha raju ji आपकी वो नेटवर्क में थोड़ा कनेक्टिविटी में दिक्कत हो जाती है 
तो एक आध सेंटेंस मिस हो जाता है मतलब ये मैंने दो तीन लोगों से पूछा तो उस पर क्या आपको हम बीच में रिमाइंड कर दें कि सर ये सेंटेंस मिस हो गया दो चीजें कीजिए राजू जी एक तो मुझे आप अच्छी जी जी सर तो, तो ये तो पहले तो आप मुझे अच्छी कनेक्टिविटी लेके दीजिए दूसरा नहीं मजाक कर रहा हूँ जब जब ही कोई मेरा छुट जाए तो प्लीज बता दीजिए मुझे तो संदीप त्रिवेदी जी आप ये कर देंगे है ना जो मर्जी कर दें मुझे बता दें तो मैं रुक जाऊंगा दोहरा दूंगा ठीक है थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू जी कोई चीज कोई चीज मुझे दोहरानी है अभी तक कि अभी तक ठीक है राजू जी अब अब ठीक है सर अब आगे बढ़ जाएं फिर आगे हम ठीक ठीक है जी ऑल राइट पाकिस्तान हैज फ्रॉम डे वन डिस्प्लेड कंपल्सिव हॉस्टिलिटी इट हैज एन आइडेंटिटी क्राइसिस फॉर पाकिस्तान द वर्ल्ड बिगैन on the 14th of august 1947 uh, comically there is a i'm told i have not seen it myself in the uh, lahore museum one of my foreign secretaries told me that there is a map huge map saying pre 1947 uh, pakistan and the entire uh, indian subcontinent is shown, shown as pakistan so that is the kind of make believe world that they live in but they have tried to project an identity which is not india uh as you very well know the effective power is with the army and the deep state the civilian government is the weakest player in the power matrix and they have cultivated an islamic affinity uh projected themselves as a savior of islam but that islamic identity could not keep bangladesh uh, or east pakistan uh, they could not retain east pakistan because of their short sighted policies the there is a social there is a social uh social uh, what is fault line in pakistan Uh, which is that it is dominated by punjabis the polity is dominated by punjabis with uh, the pashtun pakhtun khwa and uh, khyber pakhtun khwa and the baloch balochistan uh, provinces literally treated as second class uh, provinces second class citizens and the power is concentrated with the army which is mostly punjabi and that is uh, the biggest challenge you have to just see the kind of stuff that is projected about india in the pakistani textbooks uh and i was posted in pakistan i can never forget that i would see caricatures of an indian and the caricature of an indian was a short statured uh fat uh dark complexioned person with broken teeth with with big eyes with the uh, With the, with the dhoti and a bodhi, and uh, somebody who looked as a power hungry, as a bloodthirsty person. I mean, it was always how, or not always, very often how an Indian was caricatured, and uh, usually the Pakistani textbooks mention India as Hindus that are cunning, scheming, deceptive, or something equally insulting. and uh, they are taught that pakistan needs to be strong and aggressive uh, 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 otherwise india will annihilate it so there is that compulsive hostility that is built into uh, the pakistani narrative the challenge that we need to appreciate is that pakistan we you all know this is a cliche but it's also true that uh, the countries have an army or the states have an army but pakistani army has a state and they have their raison d'etre the way they are having a predominant position is by keeping a narrative of an enemy alive unless india is an enemy the justification for such a powerful army and isi is not there so that is an existential challenge for the pakistani army 
that if you make peace with India, then your own uh, power gets dissipated. And you have to, to study a little more to see how powerful the Pakistani army is and the kind of uh, uh, kind of access that they have to the economic levers. There is something called the Fauji Foundation, which is a multi-billion dollar uh, establishment. And the Pakistani army is there in everything from ag industry to agriculture to housing. Uh, so that is the kind of cushy, comfortable existence that they have. Yet it came as a surprise when on 18th March 2021, General Bajwa, uh, speaking at the Islamic Islamabad Security Dialogue, considered that Pakistan has an image problem and that India and Pakistan should look ahead, should uh, settle disputes, should find a way of being living together and cannot forever remain uh, key, uh, cannot forever remain enemies he said that the past needs to be buried and even that the kashmir dispute can be resolved through dialogue in a dignified and peaceful manner it was very unusual uh, we were cautious in responding. We welcomed it, but for with Pakistan, the mantra is not words, but action. We have time and again, we have always been an initiator of a dialogue with Pakistan. Uh, I have the figures somewhere, but I'll try to pull them out for you. I think we have here, yeah, between 1947 and 2017, over a period of 53 and uh, 70 years, we have had 45 rounds of summit level talks. But because of this compulsive hostility, everything comes back to a knot. Whenever an initiative is taken, the deep state, that is the uh, ISI and the jihadis, they strike back wherever. And such is the hostility that even the Indus Water Treaty, which is the most generous treaty that uh, at least I know in the world, where a upper riparian state has uh, conceded 80% of the water to a lower riparian state, they are not satisfied because the politics is such that India has to be projected as uh, the devil and uh, to, over, to cover up their own shortcomings and to keep the army afloat. It is so blatant. Uh, now I think because of the F FATF pressure and the other pressures, they have stopped. When I was in Pakistan in 2001, and 2001 was a very eventful year, when 9-11 happened, when there was an attack on Indian parliament, the Agra summit happened. On a Friday, what they know called Juma, after a Juma prayer, when the believers came out, there used to be tents, outside with a, with a banner to say, please contribute 10 rupees to kill a Hindu, to buy a bullet to kill a Hindu. So that is the kind of uh, venom that has been uh, accumulated. No wonder Hillary Clinton said that uh, Pakistan is a country which is nurturing snakes in its backyard. But then uh, that was turned out to be more a statement then uh, there was no action, no follow-up. So that is where it is. Uh, today, Pakistan is impoverished. It's, it is getting to be a basket case. It is uh, riven with sectarian violence. It's ties with even its uh, benefactors like Saudi Arabia and UAE have gotten impacted. For the first time, the army is under pressure. It has never happened because uh, the civilian establishment has never uh, dared to target the army, but they, they are under pressure. 11 opposition parties have joined hands to launch the Pakistani democratic movement. There is 
there are uh, there is uh, afghanistan i'll talk about that how that has become a millstone around the pakistani neck but let us be very clear in about one thing pakistan has the benefit of a strategic location and pakistan is has been very astute in doing what it has done uh, without incurring too much of a cost one of the american diplomats says that pakistan negotiates with a gun on its own temple the deviousness of their diplomacy is something which is a case study in itself because they have very little to offer but they have managed to extract uh, various things from various countries at the same time caused a lot of damage to their economy uh, we can keep on saying that pakistan is isolated but fact remains that pakistan is too large a country in its present form to be isolated unless pakistan splinters uh, it is taking advantage of its strategic location and it will continue to do so norm norm is to keep the, the channel of communication open but uh, uh, we are in touch certainly because back channels never stop despite the denials except for us uh it is very clear that terror and talks cannot go together uh, we that is our sto- sole stipulation that the terror infrastructure has to be even if it is not brought to a halt at least uh, it has to be stopped fortunately we have ceased fire uh, along the border since last year nobody knows how long it will prevail because one school of thought is that because the western sector for for the for pakistan that is afghanistan is hot therefore they want a peaceful eastern sector but from our perspective even one day of which is violent violence free is uh, a blessing they are continuing with infiltration uh, the infiltration ebbs and flows depending on uh, the Uh, mood in rawalpindi and the jihadi tanzims but uh the jihadi infrastructure remains intact and the bigger challenge today it has not yet happened but what is could happen is that the taliban fighters which know who only know two things to fight or to be a mullah once there is a bit more of stability in afghanistan they will do two things either they will fight within afghanistan or they their masters their handlers of pakistan will try to bring them uh, uh, to the pakistani occupied kashmir to create problems so we for us it is a very uh, we have to be very careful about pakistani machinations uh, it's a country which is going down, down the tube but uh, you have somebody like uh, imran khan who says who says that uh, osama bin laden was a martyr who says that pakistan afghanistan has shed the shackles of slavery when taliban comes to power and in fact the women are encumbered with uh, are under new shackles so it is a adversary with which it is very difficult to do business but uh, it the hope the possibility is that given the way their econo- economy is uh, in a free fall they may decide to at least tactically pause their uh, aggressive behavior uh, their uh, resort to terrorism at least for some time and uh, that may begin uh, see a process of or a beginning of a change but i am not very optimistic given the behavior and also given the fact that pakistan has become the cat's paw uh, of china uh, it is indebted to china and china is using pakistan as for its proxy war and uh, to also serve to do its dirty work uh, now my question to you is that 
uh, if you have any question on India Pakistan, I'll try to attempt. I'll try to answer it. Also, do, what do you think will take to have uh, even a modicum of, even if we cannot be friends, but at least have lesser hostility between India and Pakistan? Do you see a possibility, and if so, under what circumstances? Yes, Pankaj. Uh, can I ask the question? Uh, I I can also think of the answer, but uh, at the moment Sir, I, I would question. like to answer. One second. Who is Android? How can you be Android Blue Blue Droid? Uh, you will have to have a name. Can you change your yeah, name, please? Can you please yeah, change sure, your name? Sir. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sir. I'll I'll, I mean... I'll come to you, Android, in a minute. Let me go to uh, a non-Android, which is Pankaj, and then Sachit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sir. I just had a corollary question about what we were just talking about Pakistan. Sir, uh, can you shed some light on how the future of uh, SARC and organizations like that in the region uh, should, because Pakistan continues to play a spoil sport. So should yeah, we just... Yeah, I'll do leave? that. I'll yeah. do that. I'll do that. Okay. Yes, Sachit. Sachit. Good morning, I have a few questions. I'm going to... No, one, one question, please. And your audio is not good. So can you fix your audio? And I'll come back to you. Yes. Uh, so, Sonal? Sir, I was trying to answer what you asked. Yeah, please sir, go ahead. I believe, Thank you. Uh, sir, in my opinion, if we are looking for a better relation, then uh, the answer would lie in economic engagement which I believe would be the trade that we had stopped back in 2016. So uh, I think any relation is more or less built on certain business and uh, maybe we uh, re-engage in that, that could be uh, somewhere where we can uh, manage things even if they escalate otherwise. Have we ever uh, denied or have we ever said that we don't want economic engagement? N not really, sir. Yeah, so no, Sonal, you're right. You're right as a matter of principle, but the, your argument is, has one big fault, and that is you're logical and reasonable and rational. Uh, logic, rationality, reasonableness uh, does not apply with our friends because their calculations are very different. They'll cut the nose to spite the face. Uh, you remember uh, we had given the... Uh, uh, the 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 the, the uh, MNF most M M MFN status for so many years, they did right, not. Sir. And uh, when they spoke about re-engaging India, they remembered last year they said we'll import cotton and sugar from India. So we said fine. And uh, Imran Khan proposed it in one avatar, but when it came for his final signature, they opposed it. And do you know why MFN uh, in Pakistan does not want to give to India? It's not a joke, believe me. What does FM mean? mean? Uh, most favored nation. And uh, in Urdu or Punjabi, it means Sabse Pyara Desh. So how can India be the Sabse Pyara Desh? I mean, that is the kind of narrative that you see. So while for us, <coughs> we have no difficulty, but the fact that you can have a constituency come up in Pakistan, a business constituency, which will be rooting for India, uh, is something which is anathema to the leadership. Shivangi? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, sir, you asked us a question. Like, where could be hope in uh, negotiating with Pakistan, Pakistan being an irrational actor in international relations? So I believe somewhere, I might be wrong, like, I believe that answer lies in long term, in Pakistan-China relation itself, because China is not like US when it comes to giving uh, uh, economic uh, bailouts, because China as a country is very, uh, is very clear that whenever it gets, gives out anything, it wants something in return. It could be market, it could be your uh, important assets. So when US was strategically different. China is not so. China is more blatant. So they are going down that road. China will definitely capture their market because it is an export-oriented player. And this long-term hostility with China, which is bound to happen, 
because china in its own way it creates like this if Ch- no, if china no, no, shivangi i'm interjecting you make a very good point i know what you're trying to say that uh, you know g- given the uh, aggressive posture and the way the pakistan is indebted to china and the land grab that pak china will engage in will cause resentment and that is true uh, there is already murmurs uh, against china there are protests which are there are some low level protests in baluchistan there is already a backlash but the problem is that pakistan is does not have a relationship of equality with uh, china they have a relationship of a of uh, a subordinate and they are very happy with this relationship pakistan has always had uh, one crutch to lean on whether it was the us whether it's saudi arabia now whether it's china and the civilian government uh, you know it is not a true democracy where p- the establishment is res- is answerable to the people so yes in eventually that would may happen because uh, there is a limit to the amount of difficulties that the people can uh, can put up with and yes there is inflation there is corruption uh, there is anger but question is whether that anger will boil uh, boil to an extent that it could force the army and the civilian government to change course i am not sure but what you say uh- is is logical and uh, but for the foreseeable future i think this cozy relationship of uh, of pakistan becoming lit- literally a province of china is likely to continue because it serves the sh- interests of the ruling elite uh, yes. okay mean... I, i think we'll have to move on i'm sorry shivangi adarsh okay. last 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 you, last question Uh, so i wanted to answer this part uh, like the india pakistan hostility how can we reduce it <laughs> all right do that so i think uh, rather than economically or uh, dealing them with military should be the best way not in terms of uh, invasion or aggression but uh, the pakistan army since runs pakistan it is important to pressurize them and that can only happen uh, when the different parts of pakistan say uh, the pashtun area or the baluch or the sindh uh, they and they somehow uh, it pressurizes the pakistani army uh, uh, since we know that the taliban is also morally uh, pashtun dominated and there is a pashtun identity within the uh, the taliban itself and uh, there is also clamor for the pashtun uh, country sort of thing so we can somehow uh, manage to invoke those separatist feelings among Uh, those regions so that the pakistan military feels pressurized and since good they- good 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 idea adarsh good good luck good idea please uh, do that uh, when you are in a position to call the shots uh, you know there see what will be the difference between pakistan and india in that case if we behave the way the pakistan i'm not saying that we are holier than thou uh you, you have to play hardball there is something called real politic but uh, we have also to make sure that uh, we are not we are different we have already said prime, prime minister has said from the fo- from the red fort that we will extend uh that we are concerned at the situation in baluchistan but uh i i think these are easier said than done except that uh, if you know pakistan it's is only its own enemy their policies are taking them down the road of self destruction uh, it may be wiser to let them do the job for us because uh, that is the road they are on all right uh, kewal did i t- call call you to answer take your question uh, no sir uh- Sir, I have the question that uh, we saw Imran Khan present in Russia during uh, the invasion, and a lot of uh, people are saying that there is an emerging uh, Pakistan-China-Russia axis. So, is it a possibility, or are we just uh, uh, reading too much uh, about it at this point? Kable, what will uh, what will Russia get out of Pakistan? uh sir we have seen that uh, over the last few years they have uh, sort of exported their defense equipments 
to them no 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 that's true that's true you see you said excess there is a semi quasi uh, alliance between china and russia because each supports the other can each ser- helps the other in serving its objectives what is what can pakistan do for uh, russia for russia pa- pakistan but you know true pakistan is an important player for russia in the context of afghanistan and uh, it is believed that pakistan has had helped russia to open a di- dialogue a line of communication with the taliban so it was imran khan who had been trying for 23 years to uh, go to uh, to russia he could not have chosen a worse time but no i don't see a uh, three way axis developing but certainly there is a, a pakistan china axis and uh, there is a quasi alliance which could become an alliance uh, between russia and china given the short sighted policies of uh, the western world all right uh sachit you had asked about sark right uh no sir uh my audio wasn't clear last time okay uh, okay i'll have to uh, sachit i'll have to come back to you again now no sark problem. sark uh, that we, you know pakistan has been a naysayer and we have tried and tried and tried but nothing works with pakistan uh, being in a camp to ensure that no progress can be made in sa in the sark framework so it is we decided that there is no point pursuing wasting your time and uh, we have switched to bimstek which where all the sark countries other than pakistan and afghanistan are members uh, so eventually there is no there is, uh, the best way forward is to have a sark or some kind of a co- cooperational framework in in south asia but till pakistan sheds its compulsive hostility i don't think that is going to be viable let me then move to china uh i want to spend some time on china to give you a, a perspective and to understand what is the kind of uh, challenge that we are facing you know china and i have served in china also china is called in mandarin chu gaku middle kingdom and they believe that they have a mandate from heaven uh, that is the legend and the emperor uh, is uh, has been endowed with certain powers and the emperor can do nothing wrong uh xi jinping has been whipping up nationalism and he has given a new mantra to the nation to wipe out the century of humiliation what is the century of humiliation uh, the century of humiliation is the period when uh, the opium wars were fought when uh, the us uh, japan etc had taken over parts of uh, of uh, china unequal treaties were imposed so they be, he, they are whipping up that frenzy not a frenzy but an anger at uh, that so called humiliation not understanding or not realizing that practically every developing country had gone through that i mean we had uh, maybe a thousand years of humiliation so if we take to arms it is going to be anarchy but well this is china and they have ch- he has given a dream called great rejuvenation of the chinese nation that the ch- time for china has arrived Uh, i could be shocking you disappointing you but let me say that china looks down upon india for china india is a case study of what not to be they consider indians as lazy soft and they believe that we have alternatively a slavish mentality and also a colonial outlook that we uh, they believe that we are a fallen power which buckled without a fight to the british and even after independence we decided to join chogam which shows india's slavish mentality they have very little patience for democracy they believe that uh, it is wasteful and 
of late they believe that we are punching above our weight and we need to be brought down a few notches but this is not new chinese attitude towards india is has always been the same this uh, ever, and by the way we had our uh, sepoys mostly sikhs who were posted by the british in shanghai and other uh, areas uh, which we at times project as or at times some some people project as india's contacts with china china sh- uh, sees that for them it is something which is highly resented as indian sepoys being an instrument of oppression for britain so that is one side of the story how china looks at india and look at how we have been naive uh, look at our behavior there is a very good book by ambassador rajiv dogra and those of you who want to read it it's called india's world how prime ministers shaped foreign policy rajiv dogra mentions that and he has looked at the archives he has looked at uh, done, done a very close study that in 1950 and uh, china uh, uh, red army came to power in 1949 the us offered india permanent membership of the un security council instead of taiwan and uh, ussr offered it again in 1955 mrs vijay lakshmi pandit the sister of prime minister nehru was the ambassador to the us and she wrote to say that the state department had cooked up uh something and that was to unseat china as a permanent member and bring india instead the response of prime minister nehru was if we do such a thing what will china think i'm paraphrasing him he said as far as we are concerned this is out it is a clear affront for china and it would mean a kind of a break between india and china i mean in today's context if you see you are aghast that the leadership of the day was more concerned about what will china think than india's national interests that is the kind kind of naivety and romance that uh, romantic outlook that we had towards uh, unrealistic outlook that we had towards foreign policy and we are paying the price at times it would seem that or let me put it this way that of late we have become uh, more conscious of how the world functions we are becoming realistic but we still have a long way to go china is a serial aggressor determined to rewrite the rules of engagement today given their economic might their military muscle uh and that they have been nibbling away at the territory of neighbors and getting away with that their appetite has been wetted to dislodge the us and to create a china centric regime a world a re- regional and world order the they have tested the waters in south china sea where they nibbled away at territory of one country after the other and nothing happened and today south china sea has become the uh, chinese lake uh however in the chinese vision of becoming the new hegemon there is an obstacle as they see it not now but potential obstacle and that is a country called india given india's size given her strength given the fact that india is now in enhancing her linkages with the western world that india has become a member of quad that india can become economic uh, can rise economically india is seen as a potential challenge and therefore it is very important for china to keep india off balance uh to keep needling her to retard her economic growth to embarrass india and uh, there are various ways that they have been doing that they have been waging a proxy war against india through pakistan they have been nibbling away at indian territory they have been 
ignoring India's core concerns. And of late, what has happened is that the what we call the comprehensive national power, that gap has increased. In 1988, when Rajiv Gandhi gave, went to Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi went to Beijing, and the relations were getting normalized, our per capita income was similar. Today, China's per capita income is four to four five times larger, and it is all about power. And remember the famous saying of Mao that power flows through the barrel of the gun. For China, everything is power politics. No rules apply. They do not believe in any rules. So long as it serves an objective, they will honor a treaty convention uh, agreement and thereafter discard it. Uh, why Galwan? Nobody knows. The strategic community, the Indian experts are still divided. But there could be various reasons that we are building border infrastructure. When China does it, it is fine. When India does it, it is provocative. Uh, that India joined the world in demanding accountability by China for the uh, corona pandemic. That we are uh, a member of Quad and the Quad is getting strengthened. One of their very, they are quite upset about the fact that India became the first country to oppose BRI. And BRI was a pet project of uh, Xi Jinping. So uh, one school of thought is that they have taken personal affront. And the growing ties of India uh, with the West, especially the US, and so on and so forth. So basically, if India pursues its core concerns, it is wrong. If China pursues it, it is right, because China has the mandate from heaven. And uh, they have decided to keep India off balance, keep India. They are lying in wait, as far as I can make out. The 3,488-kilometer-long 3, 3, line of actual control and the entire line is alive, the entire boundary is alive, and they are lying in wait. Um, for us, it is very, very important to uh, be ready for the long haul, because remember with China, uh, they are in no hurry, they don't have any elections, they don't have any media, they don't have any opposition to account for. So they will play the waiting game, and uh, the, we had a standoff with China in the Somdurangchu Valley, which had lasted six and a half years. And the other reason is to, for them to send a message to India's neighbors. They, why did the stage Galwan? They thought that they will surprise India. And, uh, uh, but the way India has responded perhaps surprised them. And the effort on their part was uh, to show to the neighbors that China is the new game in town, to show the US that India is punching above its weight. Uh, we have so far handled it very well, but we need a whole of government approach to thwart Chinese ambitions. And that is where Quad does play a role. I mentioned to you earlier in the beginning of my remarks that India's the Galwan was a turning point for India when we dropped a reticence. Uh, there is, we may deny it, we may agree to it. There is a direct relationship between the aggression of China and the evolution of Quad, because China has picked up fights with Australia, Japan, US, and the others. And today, no country is in a position to push back China on, on its own you have to have a convergence of forces, of, uh, of countries, of abilities. And that can only be done if like-minded countries come together, but that's easier said than done. Uh, nobody, nobody wants to take on China indi uh, individually. No country wants to choose between in India and China. Mo most of the countries have strong economic linkages with China. So it's a difficult situation, but Quad coming together would certainly be a message to China that 
uh, if they push beyond a certain point, there could be a pushback. Quad has been has grown. It's a very young organization, but again, the development in Russia and uh, Ukraine is a worrisome factor because the American attention uh, is likely to shift from the Indo-Pacific to to Europe, and their focus on Quad may dissipate. Uh, and the pity is, and the baffling part is, that the US had quit Afghanistan saying that they want to focus on internal matters and uh, to deal with China, because China is the biggest threat. And yet, they have dropped the ball on China, they have gone after Russia. And in this whole exercise, China is the biggest gainer. For us, it is a strategic nightmare, but we have no choice but to continue on the path that we are, uh, to continue strengthening our infrastructure, and to continue build, building leverages. Hats off to the Indian Armed Forces and the way the government of India has uh, acted in unison to push back the Chinese challenge. I hope that, uh, and this, this is something personal, I hope that in this hour of need, the, some political parties within India do not try to score brownie points, but uh, speak in one voice. That is what uh, you expect different political parties, media, academia to do when there is an external threat. And that is what most of the countries do, but India, the behavior of certain forces is uh, rather unfortunate. And that is the price that you are paying for democracy. But again, let me stop here and uh, take if you have any questions. Vinesh Shankar, sir, good, mo good morning. Yeah, there are some questions. Vishnuji, there are some questions in the chat box. You All can... right, I will do that. Uh, Kalpesh, <coughs> so what is your question, Kalpesh? I couldn't understand. Kalpesh, all right. Mayank, China is a great economic power success, a great military power. Isn't India adopted the wrong political model? Whether Mayank, do you want uh, democracy to be substituted with uh, dictatorship? Uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. No, sir. Actually, this question was asked to me in one of the mock interviews. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Isn't it we are portraying democracy as a holy cow? And this is a we have to hide China's model adopt China's Well, there are certainly there is a success story uh, that China is a, is an economic success story, but it comes at a huge cost. Uh, the China is a country which has also had the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, millions of people dead, uh, and the kind of exploitation of resources etc. that has taken place, natural resources, uh, the way uh, townships have been. Uh, you know, whether it is afforestation, whether it is uh, ecological damage. I mean, they have done it all. Uh, but yes, they have attained economic progress at a cost. Now, uh, whether you want to bear the cost is a question. And it has come at a huge price of civil liberties. Uh, they have managed to prevent 400 million births by having a single child policy. They, they have inflicted Tiananmen Square on the people. Uh, fam families disappear overnight. Villages disappear overnight. Now, are you willing to pay that price? So, yes, uh, we are all for economic development. I myself uh, have been saying that economic development first, second and third. But 
are you willing to uh, put up with a blood tainted model of economic development where natural resources have been exploited uh, in a manner that china is on the brink of ecological disaster there is a just read about the three gorges dam uh, 21 uh, gigawatts of power generation capacity and you will see the horror stories that are emerging i'm not berating the chinese economic development certainly they have uh, done well but they have incurred a huge cost but the question is uh, how long will this uh, model continue there are possibilities that this model will fray because hitherto there was a social compact between the people and the country and the leaders uh, the the political leadership com compact was with the people that we will give you economic development you stay out of politics uh communist party today has a difficult task on its hands of a uh, key retaining the support of the people and that is why this nationalism is being whipped up but nationalism is again a two edged sword uh you know the problem i was in soviet union when perestroika and glasnost happened but nobody saw the iron cut the uh the country collapsing the way they did i don't know how long will this uh, structure in china last it could last another 50 years or it could collapse tomorrow because a system which has been built on oppression and aggression uh has cannot continue forever and uh, they may overplay their hand i am not saying that india has uh, there is no scope for india to improve we have done things right we have done things wrong could we have done better yes we have, could have done better uh, it's not that democracies don't succeed other democracies have done it and india can also do it uh, we we have made progress but there is certainly room for improvement and that is another discussion but i for one believe that uh the greatest strength of india is her democracy and we have proven that even a developing country even a poor country uh can make democracy work so i think uh with all our faults we are still uh, a success story but there is room for making it a bigger success and for that we need uh a leadership that can deliver and fortunately we have a leadership today that is how i look at it uh shivangi so for the previous question uh, like this uh, per, the person said it is asked in the interview can we also go about uh, giving a case like so if we look at the, the case of uh, swan shui fan shui i don't know i do not know how to pronounce it properly the tennis star uh, who, who leveled charges of sexual assault on a party worker and she was suddenly disappeared and she was a two times olympic gold winner and well, she yeah fans yeah, go, ahead. go ahead go ahead yeah yeah, so yeah i can like i put across this and so would we want to have democracy uh, would we want to have this kind of development sorry last comment is uh, like it could be a rhetoric question so the choice is do we really want to have that kind of development no absolutely that's what i'm trying to say that uh, what what is what kind of a development that you want do you want a development where you're gagged where your human your rights as a citizen or as human being are quashed or you want a, a democracy or a development which is balanced i mean again i'm saying that we there is room for improvement in india the problem frankly is that everybody knows the rights people don't know the responsibilities i believe that we have too much of democracy in so i some some firming up of uh, the balance between rights and responsibilities is some is required but i will not trade my country's democracy or uh, my form of government our form of government for anything uh sonal and sachit sonal so my question is regarding the future of sco 
uh, vis-a-vis uh, China's thought on the future and ours, because we have the Central Asian region there, we have Iran there now, and also Pakistan. So I wish to ask what, according to you, is the future of that forum? Well, you know, SEO is China-driven. It is basically a, a, a forum which is turning out to be a forum which is anti-West, which uh, is there to further the Chinese geopolitical uh, interests and uh, Russia, Pakistan, etc., have a common agenda. You know that there is a kind of a new quintet or quad emerging, an alternative one, which which comprises of uh, Russia, China, Iran, um, to an extent Pakistan and others. So it is a forum which is there essentially to serve Chinese interests. But for us, the being having a presence there is important because uh, we bring about balance, we have a voice there, and we uh, it enhances our leverage. Given the fact that we have a difficult relations with China, certainly India's views, India's suggestions will not be paid much heed to, but our presence is important. And uh, for us to see what is going on there, what is the kind of confabulations that are taking place are important. Uh, SCO will continue to be important so long as China is powerful and Russia is there, but uh, that it could be expanded further or it could become a more influential forum is something that I doubt. Sachet? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, sir, I had a question. Uh, so, uh, basically, similar to Russia attacking Ukraine, is it possible that China may take advantage of uh, American attention uh, being shifted and uh, it may attack Taiwan? One country that is watching it very, very closely is China, and uh, China will draw its own conclusions. Uh, you know, I would take you back to 2012 when China occupied the Scarborough Shoal of Philippines and Philippines and the US have a security arrangement, but the US did not react. And Obama only wagged his finger and told China to behave. The rest is history. Uh, the fact that up till now, at least Biden and NATO have been saying that they will not send boots on the ground shows that uh, their appetite to engage in military conflict is limited. And uh, they are resorting to economic sanctions. You know, the difficulty today with the West is that instead of uh, appreciating the security and strategic considerations, they, they frame issues in terms of economy. While I must add here that the kind of punitive sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are, are doing the trick, they are doing the damage, which is very rare for them to have such kind of sanctions. But if the idea is to sanction China for uh, action against Taiwan and not intervene militarily, I think China will be encouraged. And China, I, be, I my own reading is that has done a lot of gaming. And one of the scenarios that they're looking at is a massive all out attack, uh, air, cyber, land, sea, to overwhelm Taiwanese defenses. And uh, by the time the US reacts or the Western world reacts to present a fate a company, because remember, uh, an aircraft carrier is not, or a group of aircraft carriers are not stationed in South China Sea, the nearest is Okinawa or Guam. So they, they can mark their time, they can uh, go in for a misadventure, but also let us remember that Taiwan is not, not a pushover. They, are, they have also gamed all the uh, situations. They are also very heavily armed. 
so it would depend on uh, the appetite of xi jinping for a misadventure but certainly uh, they will be watching very carefully and judging whether uh, they can they can push the button but having said that china's appetite uh, for aggression and expansionism will be vetted and uh, there's a we are in certainly a phase where the west's ability to uh, enforce the rules of uh, engagement is weakening steadily uh, i need to wind up last question tina uh, good morning sir uh, sir uh, I, my question was uh, is uh, what exactly is china's intention with india is it uh, are they defending their economic position in the world or do they have more malicious intentions uh, with regard to taking over india's territory or and kind of annihilating india as a similar to pakistan so is it an uh, primarily economic or is it something else is it military you know i think i tried uh, very hard to explain my position but uh, perhaps i could not and at this juncture uh, I, you know they want to basically <coughs> basically embarrass india and cut india to size they want india to uh, to be in a subordinate position to china because they believe that they are the, uh, the, the they should be the sole power there is a saying in china that uh, there can be only one lion on a mountain the mountain is asia and the lion is china so that is the vision but i'm sure that they will be surprised uh, if they were to engage in further misadventure uh, mr goel uh, i'll have to wind up now but we can have a follow up session one of these days i'd like to thank 